better looking version of me. The picture was taken a couple years back. Uh, so i am uh, been at Shopify for about 18 months now. Uh, I went to the University of Waterloo, spent most of my career in the Waterloo region. So until Shopify, I've done most of my time in startups. And years ago, I worked at BlackBerry, whatever that was. Uh, good. Um, so since I've been at Shopify, uh, I've worked in Flow. I spent about six months there. And then I sort of switched to the Scripps project. Um, what David showed you, we, we, that Scripps product has been around for, I guess, three years now. And it's great. It adds a lot of merchant value. Um, what I'm going to tell you a story about today is how we are reimagining that uh, in a new project. Um, so keep that in mind as I go through. We do have a product in the world, the Scripps, uh, and we're doing something else. Uh, and I'm going to talk you through that and how we're thinking about these problems. Cool. So just a reminder, Shopify Plus, right? Shopify Plus is commerce, is Shopify but for high complexity, high revenue merchants. Uh, and so, of course, at Shopify, we support a broad spectrum of merchants from people selling tickets out of their garage all the way up to global organizations that are doing hundreds of millions in revenue. So there's a huge diversity there. And Shopify Plus, we solve problems for the latter group, as David told you. And as an engineer working on that stuff, I get to, of course, tackle some of these really tricky problems. So you might imagine a lot of these problems are related to scale, performance, right? Like some of these businesses are doing so much volume that we have a lot of vertical scaling challenges in our in our software and our infrastructure. Uh, you know, we also have product complexity challenges. David spoke to a lot of that. Um, Specifically today, I'm going to talk about how we make commerce extensible. Um, but before I get into that, I want to go a little bit into the technology architecture of Shopify. Um, I apologize in advance for those non-developers. I, I realize this is a cross-disciplinary audience, and Scripps is a pretty technical product. Um, so I tried to appease the devs in the room and try to not go too deep, but like there might be some slides that lose a few people. I apologize. I'm trying my best. OK, so the core of Shopify is built with Ruby on Rails. It's been Rails forever, for 15 years now. It, Shopify really grew up alongside Rails. It may be the biggest Rails code base in the world. I don't actually know, but it's pretty big. Um, and, but it's been the right choice for us for, for a long time. Uh, this image here uh, is actually taken from the Shopify blog. It's, if you follow that, I think it was posted in 2019 at some point. But we see here we have. You know, on the y-axis modularity, on the x-axis number of deployment units. So we get like this ball of mudness thing at the bottom, and then you know the comparison between a modular monolith and, and the microservices architecture. Um, and so it, Shopify actually falls somewhere around here. I mean, different people may have different opinions where that should go. Uh, over time, it's been trending up as teams refactor, um, reorganize, and, and just generally figure out how. A thousand developers work on a single Rails code base. Um, we have other services in, in play to do different things, but this is really our core. Um, and so, with so much diversity across the merchants, uh, and with so many teams working on Shopify on an architecture like this, it's, it's super critical to be very disciplined and thoughtful as we build out product, uh, because we want to keep the out of the box experience for merchants simple. Uh, but we also want to, and, and we want to prevent our code from drifting downwards into this ball of mud. Um, so how do we do that? We have this product principle that it's definitely tossed around internally quite a lot, but I think it's, it's really important to kind of highlight this. But it's built what most merchants need most of the time. Um, and so this is kind of the, the, this underlies every feature we build here. If it's something that most merchants need, but not most of the time, we don't build that. Or if most merchants don't need it, we don't build that. Uh, this allows us to keep the things we build broadly applicable to the diverse merchants we have, uh, while also keeping our code base and our core simple. Um, and so another interesting outcome of this is like as we actually add more merchants to the platform, if you do some napkin math, you'll realize that actually the core of Shopify actually gets smaller over time. Because what the intersection of what most merchants need it actually gets smaller. Um, so how do we, what do we do in this situation? So Shopify, we have an app store. This is how we solve this problem. So we build the core, we make the rest possible by this thriving part partner ecosystem, thousands of partners, thousands of apps. And through APIs and integration points, partners are able to build everything else that isn't what most merchants need most of the time. Um, 
and so with apps, merchants can satisfy their unique needs. We can have a partner ecosystem of many companies that are also innovating on top of Shopify, making money, running their own business, uh, and Shopify's core can stay simple. Okay, so get a little more technical here. Uh, a metaphor we like to use internally to drive this point is that of a computer operating system. So in an operating system, right, you have a kernel. Uh, the kernel in, in, takes care of the interactions with the hardware, and then we have sort of user space apps that run, and they make syscalls to the kernel to do useful things, right? This is a very simplified view of, of an OS, but this is a, a we like to use this metaphor. And in Shopify, it looks like this. Uh, so we actually call our, our core sort of call it the commerce kernel. It's a little corny, but uh, it's, a, it's a useful metaphor, so we stick with it. Um, so our kernel exposes APIs, right? And then we have apps in the user land that can make API calls to the kernel to do useful stuff. Uh, and then inside the kernel, we have these commerce primitives, so things like products, uh, shipping, customers, these sorts of things that show up across the board in all commerce models. Uh, these are accessed through the kernel in a protected way. Okay, so you might have an app here on the left, and it's interacting with Shopify in a few ways today. Uh, traditionally, these apps end up getting hosted on their own infrastructure, so they provide their own UIs, they uh, have their own teams that are you know, running on Heroku or AWS or wherever, it doesn't matter, and these apps will use Shopify APIs to interact with us. So we have GraphQL APIs, we have REST APIs, um, this is how a lot of apps work. Alternatively, Shopify might send a message to the app, uh, something like a webhook or a REST. Uh, so some commerce event might happen, like an order gets placed. Uh, and when that happens, if an app, particular app is listening for that event, Shopify sends them a webhook. Uh, and so these APIs and webhooks allow or make Shopify extensible, and uh, apps can add value to merchants by exploiting that extensibility. And again, that lets us keep what we do uh, targeting most merchants most of the time, what most merchants do most of the time. Okay, and so for many merchants, a few apps plus the core of Shopify ends up being more than enough, right? So you might have two apps here with some APIs and some webhooks, uh, but at the plus level, right, at the upmarket level where we have these high complexity, high GMB merchants, um, GMB gross stand for, I don't realize the exact acronym, growth merchandising volume, so like how much money they make. We say it a lot here, so I apologize. Catch that. Uh, so plus merchants might look like this, right? So lots of apps, do lots of different things. And on one hand, this is actually really good because it's the system working by design. Uh, every time the merchant needs a particular new bit of functionality or their business gets more complex, there's an app for that in the app store so they can go there and solve their problem. But on the other hand, uh, a growing number of dependencies on apps can have some costs. So an example of that would be you know, inconsistent product product experiences. If each of these apps has a different UI style, design patterns, you get some fragmented UX. Um, interaction effects between the apps can occur if you have 30 apps and they're all making API calls. You know, that's a more complex environment for the merchant to be operating a business within. They're making weird interactions. Uh, and lastly, scalability challenges. So David alluded to this during a flash sale. If Shopify is sending API calls or webhooks to some of these apps, and, and these apps are, are sort of just a server running, you know, in someone's basement. I don't know how common that is anymore. But if you know what I mean, if, if that team hasn't prepared for this type of scale, uh, those apps get taken offline, and the merchant suffers as a result. Um, and a lot of these teams don't have the capacity or resources to scale infrastructure the way Shopify does. And furthermore, this type of architecture limits us to what I call kind of coarse-grained customization. So a good REST API is useful, uh, but what if a merchant wants to customize the deep, deep internals of the system at a grain that's fine that can't be exposed necessarily through a REST API? Um, and so, as David talked with you about discounts, that's a great example of this, right? We have a discounts feature in our admin where you can do some basic stuff. You can do buy one, get one, some percentage off. Uh, so for a lot of simple discount rules, that's great. Uh, but you know, these plus merchants have very complex promotions. We're not going to build a product for that because not what most merchants need most of the time, never mind the actual challenge of, of how we would design something like that. Um, so we need another way to be more sensible. Okay, so before I get into how we might improve this, I'm gonna take us back to operating system metaphor land and talk about this thing called EBDF, which is, 
was new to me, and I don't know how many people have heard of this. Anybody? I got one hand. That's cool. Okay. So for those who don't know, I'll try to explain quickly. Uh, eBPF comes from the Linux kernel. It stands for Extended Berkeley Packet Filter. Uh, it's a custom instruction set and virtual machine for running those instructions securely inside the kernel. And so a user space application can actually compile a BPF program, install that into the kernel, um, and it can do useful things. Uh, originally, this was just EPF or Berkeley packet filter, and it was used to allow a user space process to define custom rules for how packet filtering would work on a network socket. Uh, but since then, it's actually evolved to do a lot more different things. Okay, so back to remember this picture. We have our kernel, our hardware, our user space. So with BPF, we can have a hooks in the kernel. Uh, these hooks allow BPF programs to run in the kernel. Um, and so the, there's some interesting sort of uh, characteristics about this. One is that BPF programs are not actually Turing complete, so they actually disallow loops explicitly, and, and that's intentional because these programs have to run quickly, deterministically, right? We don't want a custom program or user space program holding up some critical kernel operation, uh, so they're bounded. Uh, because of the nature of the custom instruction set in VM, they end up being secure in a sandbox, uh, which allows for safe customization of the kernel. Uh, this is great for companies who need that type of thing because you know, programming the Linux kernel turns out it's pretty hard. It's a huge code base, it's super complex. Not every company has that expertise, so with this type of system, you can customize it without actually having to open the code base and do the thing. Uh, and this actually gaining in popularity, believe it or not. It's been around for a long time, but more recently there's been some really great talks out there you can watch from companies like Netflix uh, and Facebook. Their, their infrastructure teams are doing super cool stuff around like, DDoS mitigation, um, load balancing, observability. There's some really interesting applications of this, so uh, expect to hear more of this is my guess, but could be wrong. Okay, back to Shopify. So remember, we have to make this sensible. So we actually asked, how can we take this EPF architecture and apply it to a commerce kernel? Uh, what if apps could run code securely inside of Shopify? Is my sound cutting it a lot? No? Okay. Uh, so could, could this type of architecture help us with scalability and performance of, of these apps? Could it help us present a more consistent experience to our merchants? And could it allow partners to solve more complex problems for merchants? If we could poke these extensibility holes throughout our monolith and allow for synchronous customization of Shopify with code, uh, we actually thought, yeah, we, we can solve all these problems. So last year, someone may have said something like this, let's build a development platform for synchronous extensibility. I don't think anyone actually said this, but it looks cool as a quote. But you have to disappear, right? We, we, if we want to take untrusted third-party code run it synchronously on our most critical off-path process in Shopify, we know it needs to be a few things. So of course it needs to be guaranteed fast. We can't have these things hanging and blocking some fire process. And it needs to be secure. You can't have anyone injecting some malicious thing that you know steals data, whatever. Uh, so those two characters are super important. So when we started looking at the technology options for this type of problem, we looked at a few things. So we looked at V8, JavaScript engine. Uh, we looked at Google Functions, AWS Lambda, MRuby. Uh, most of these things had some kind of fundamental limitation. I won't go into the details, uh, but in many cases, it's actually the performance. And you know, if we're going to run third-party code in our system, we need that code to be fast. Uh, and with a lot of these things, it wasn't the case. With say some AWS Lambda, you have a HTTP connection that might be slow, uh, or it might be based on Docker. And, Docker, you have a cold start problem. Um, so we just found kind of issues with all of these. But then we stumbled upon this technology, so WebAssembly. So next, oh, next uh, survey, how many people heard of WebAssembly? Yeah. Cool, that's good. Uh, makes me happy. So I'll tell you, for those who haven't, I'll still tell you about what it is, don't worry. Uh, this is the official definition, so take a second to read that. WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a stack-based virtual machine. WASM is designed as a portable target for a compilation of high-level languages like C. High-level languages like C. I think they injected a joke into this. Uh, enabling deployment on the web for client and server apps. 
Okay, so that's like pretty technical stuff. I don't know if that's useful to anyone, but but what it, what is actually useful for for us for this problem? So for those who have experience in web development, you know almost all the logic in a modern web app in the browser is either written in JavaScript or is compiled into JavaScript. Uh, that doesn't actually mean JavaScript is the best tool for the problems that we want to bring to the web. Uh, and you know, being a dynamically typed language, interpreted language has some challenges. Uh, JIT compilation can only do so much to optimize code, and it can be hard to bring computationally intensive apps into the browser with JavaScript. So things like 3D graphics, VR, AR, games, uh, data processing, simulations, these types of things are fundamentally limited in this type of um, uh, environment. Um, and also, many other apps that have been around for a long time are written in languages that isn't JavaScript. So if we want to take an old app that, you know, something that might have been written 10 years ago in, in another language, bring that to the web, you know, how can we do that in a way that doesn't involve rewriting it? And WebAssembly actually provides an answer to all of that, and it, it has a Recently, it's, it's an open web standard. It's supported by all major browsers, so it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. It's solving all of these problems. And, and it works by taking your high level program uh, written in one of those languages and compiling it down to this little binary. That binary can execute very fast inside of your browser. So, some examples of, of how this has been used to do cool stuff. Uh, last year in 2019, Google brought Google Earth to the web with WebAssembly. Uh, prior to that, so Google Earth is written in C++ and it was a native desktop app for a long time. Um, you know, so it could run on your desktop or mobile. Uh, it also, there was also a native Chrome extension that could run Google Earth, but as of last year, it's actually through WebAssembly available on all major browsers. Um, in 2018, AutoCAD, which is a 30 year old code base, uh, was ported to web, WebAssembly. That's a really cool example. Um, and also, turns out it's a great way to see Get crypto miners into the web, uh, <laughs> but don't try that at home. Don't try that. So, beyond the browser, though, there's actually growing companies that are bringing WebAssembly to the server. To the server. Uh, so, through initiatives to push the spec forward, things like WASI interface types. These are WebAssembly things I won't go into, but really interesting stuff is happening. Uh, these WebAssembly VMs can actually start to bring benefits to server-side applications. Uh, by the way, these pictures are taken from. Uh, Person named Lynn Clark. She writes blogs on Mozilla hacks that are really, really awesome. Um, if you want to learn more about assembly, I would strongly encourage you to check out her blogs. Cool. Okay, so we thought, what if we built some serverless infrastructure that could run WebAssembly modules? Maybe that's a good first step. Um, so we actually we wrote one. That was the first thing we did. Um, so take our friendly user here. He's got a WebAssembly module, wants to run it somewhere. Very much like a Google Functions, Amazon Lambda, serverless type of API. You can take that module, deploy it. Uh, we also have these schema functions that represent the function signature of, of these modules. Uh, we knew going in, we wanted this whole thing to be type checked end to end. So uh, having this schema file declaring that signature up front was important to us. And of course, unsurprisingly, next, uh, once you deploy this module, you can call it on a URL. By sending your arguments to that function, we take those arguments, we write it to the WebAssembly virtual machine, we invoke the module, we get the result back out, we get to the user. Uh, so this is really cool. It lets us host WebAssembly modules on the server, and you know you can deploy them and run them, and that's great. Uh, but like it's useful for a lot of stuff, but it's not really closing the loop with what I described earlier, wanting to make commerce extensible. Uh, we thought it was an important part, but we knew we needed more. Um, you know, by itself, this serverless functions thing doesn't give us that end to end commerce development platform. Uh, so for that, we needed other pieces. And most importantly, we needed an actual software development kit, or SDK, that partners and app developers could download and build these modules with. So for this, we turned to another interesting technology called assembly script. So assembly scripts, anyone heard of that? Cool. You don't count this. Uh, so it's not that complicated. Assembly script is just a compiler that takes some TypeScript and creates a WebAssembly module. So if you have some TypeScript and you want to run that in WebAssembly, you use Assembly script. Super easy. Uh, and since many Shopify partners are already comfortable with JavaScript, they use this to write a lot of their apps and things like Node, uh, we thought this would be a good choice since TypeScript is you know, of the same family. It's not a hard transition. Uh, I told you before that you know, C and C++ are great for WebAssembly, but a lot of the ecosystem, the app ecosystem, Shopify, you know, a lot of these developers aren't writing C. Um, 
So we thought this was a pretty good sort of like compromise. All right, so here we have a function signature expressed in TypeScript. So we take a shopping cart object in and we, turn a, we return a discount object. And you just look at this and think about it. This seems kind of useful, right? If, if a third party can implement this function, they can write code, they can express whatever discount they want, whatever promotion they want. They just have to write the rules that makes that shopping cart safe and produces a discount. Uh, and we already know, so we have assembly script and WebAssembly have that function, we can run it fast and securely in our environment. So something like this, back to our kernel metaphor now. We want Shopify kernel to be able to call out these functions, and these functions are fast and secure, uh, even though Shopify doesn't know anything about the details of that implementation. So since we built a service to run those functions in WASM, we can do this now. Uh, to make this even easier, we built a Ruby gem that makes it super easy for Shopify developers to wire up the invocation of these modules with whatever component inside of the Rails app they are working with. Um, the gem kind of hides the complexity of marshaling data, of fetching the pump right, right function URL, of invoking it. It owns the networking aspect, so it guarantees you know, the networking is working right, the caches are working. So it sort of hides a lot of complexity of actually invoking these things from the uh, Shopify developer that wants to build it. And so that's really cool, but remember, this is actually where we're going to go. We want this full SDK. We want to get these sensibility points all around Shopify that gives these app partners a comprehensive commerce SDK to build things with. Um, we want them to build full applications for commerce that span many function endpoints, and they not need to know anything about where they're hosted or how they're called. Um, so for us, the last missing piece here was something that came to us through the Shopify app CLI. Uh, this is a product that Shopify launched last year to help our partners build traditional Shopify apps. So something that might be hosted on Node or Rails, if you want to do that as a Shopify partner, you can download this CLI, command uh, line interface, and you can use a few commands and you get a, a Rails app that you can actually then just deploy to Heroku. It's all integrated, so it really takes away the friction of building apps for Shopify. Uh, and so since we have this already, we can actually take our WebAssembly stack and, and build to into this product to make it very really easy to create these functions um, that do this synchronous commerce extensibility thing. So just using a few Shopify commands, right? So you're not fussing with WebAssembly compilers or anything like that. We can even make that all much easier through this command line. Okay, so next I'm gonna just review sort of like preliminary results and challenges. Okay, so first it's very fast. These modules, we've taken a bunch of scripts from the original scripts product ported them and we ran them and it actually turns out we've got massive performance gains here, order of magnitude or more, uh, when we take that assembly script and compile it. Uh, so our latency is measured in microseconds instead of milliseconds, which is really awesome. Next is tooling and language support. So this has actually been a bit of a challenge and you know the majority of Shopify partners are, are used to working with JavaScript, Ruby, these languages, they have very rich ecosystems, they have deep standard libraries, mature tool chains. Whereas assembly scripts is very new, it lacks a lot of these rich libraries. Um, and so for us, the question is, will these partners be able to use it? Uh, and can our team bridge the gap in the meantime by building tooling? Beyond that, having good debugability, observability, super important, right? Stack traces, logging, with the usual stuff that a developer would be working with when building an app. Um, that's gonna be critical for us, but again, this is something that with our stack, with WebAssembly and assembly script, doesn't come for free. Remember, this is, this is pretty new stuff. WebAssembly's only been around for a few years. Assembly script has only been around for even less than that. Uh, so this is all very, very new. Uh, and so a lot of these fundamentals are not quite there yet. And we're excited because we can actually help push it forward. And, and we do believe that this technology stack is, is going to take um, hold in the industry. It's, like I said, it's already an open web standard, supported by other browsers. So this is happening. Um, I like to think we're on the right side of that growth curve. Uh, but it could also maybe be the next flash, hopefully not. So the last major challenge we're facing is, is in the area of API design. And so this is specifically the APIs that we're exposing to the app developers by way of those TypeScript functions. Remember, this is a 15-year model that we're trying to extend, and so the, a lot of the domain models in there, they've evolved over time. Many of them are not perfect. We have lots of internal technical data within the company. Um, we don't want to look at that 
those internal details out to partners through these function signatures, right? We want to we want to instead expose a clean and consistent API to partners, despite maybe the internals from which these things are called are not so clean. Um, so how do we do that? How do we ensure that we don't have three different product classes? Three, you know, this is a big challenge for us. And to wrap up, a few next steps. So one thing we're looking at doing is, is opening up system APIs. Uh, so there's an interesting part of WebAssembly stack called Quasi that lets WebAssembly modules access the system. So today, everything's a pure function. But in the future, we could give developers access to things like random numbers, the dates, you know, stuff you probably take for granted with languages you're used to using. Like, those are not for free in, in the stack. Uh, but there, there is tooling available now to start to expose some of that stuff. Uh, and really, really interesting. There's some cool stuff that, cool capabilities that could open up when we start talking about giving these modules access to this or the network socket. Um, so we're exploring that. Next, we want to make our developer tools really, really good. So when we give this solution to the hands of our partners, we want it to feel like a tier one platform. We want it to feel like an SDK that we're used to, you know, working with, with you know, some of the most you know, common biggest SDKs in the world, whether it's like iOS or Android, we don't want this to feel like a you know, crappy tool. Uh, so things like debuggers, testing tools, deployment pipelines, all this stuff, we want to make those tools more mature so that this really feels like a great development platform. And lastly, we want to add more commerce APIs. And so today we just have a few, we saw that discount one. Um, but in the future, we want to have potentially hundreds of these things. And in doing that, we hope to achieve having this comprehensive and consistent commerce API. So if you put these things together, right, access to system interfaces or side effects within your functions, mature developer tools, and a comprehensive model of commerce, we can actually take these individual <coughs> functions or, or scripts, and we can actually move those towards a technology platform that allows for full, rich application development. And these applications can run on Shopify infrastructure in a secure way. Um, this is really the end goal for us, and, and when we achieve this, we're going to permit, I think, massive extensibility across the platform. Uh, it's just going to unlock huge value for, for our merchants. So this is where we hope to go. Um, thank you very much. That is it. So I get exactly two questions. One of the slides at the beginning shows uh, uh, the deployment uh, adoption of different technologies. You had like uh, a kind of graphic chart there. So I've seen microservices in the top right corner, so it looks like the, there are not too many deployments. Not no, before that, before. No, before. The four. The four, four platforms. Yeah, here. So it looks like the microservices and the distributed big ball of mud for for number of deployments. Um, should I understand you have more deployments there, or is is that? Uh, and then, so are so you I asking have, a question about the grid itself, or yeah, what? It's like a function, or can I infer from here that? Uh, you have more deployments for microservices, or uh, because you have the Shopify on the left, I see on the left side, yeah? Yeah, so this this is just a, you know, I guess a very high level, simplified view of just architectures that are often uh, used in the industry, so microservice versus monolith, uh, where microservice has more deployment units, so that's what that's showing. Because I was sure. trying to infer that uh, uh, the number of deployments uh, is different from different type of technology. Is that true or not? I think it depends on the company. Everyone does it differently. I think there's many companies that do microservice architecture with Rails, many that don't, many that. So I think it, the answer is it depends. Um, this is very much simplifying how you know architecture works. Uh, uh, from, from this uh, uh, graph here, so I understand that. Shopify is more towards uh, modular monolithic. Yes, exactly. So is that the reason, because you mentioned also microservices, is that the reason that uh, you are not uh, pushing toward microservices? Let's talk after. That's uh, beyond the scope of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go with the person with their hand up first. Hi, 
Good talk. So the assembly script, how do you isolate that? Is it by process, by date space? Because you're probably not starting it off uh, the process of rejection. Yeah, exactly. So uh, one of the things with WebAssembly VM, so we use a VM called Lucid, which is by Fastly. They're also doing some serverless WebAssembly stuff. Um, this, this VM actually boots in process. And uh, so we have a, a wrapper around these VMs. So we, we can end up running thousands of VMs inside of a single process on a single server, uh, which effectively removes any sort of cold start time. Uh, these things boot in microseconds. And, and as long as we have the WebAssembly module memory, it's, it's virtually instant. So there's no Docker cold starts or anything like that. There's no process. It's all a single process. It's so cool. Thank you. There's some great talks uh, by Fastly on sort of like containerless isolation, uh, which I would encourage you. If that's interesting to you, uh, what facets are doing there and how they talk about it is really, really good. All right, thanks, Mitch. And there'll be time at the end to ask more questions.